top of the morning and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide Macaulay. The headlines. Officials warned that Western military is running out of ammunition to prosecute Ukraine war. Ukraine seizes nearly $5.5 million in Russian defense companies' assets. Plus, Kremlin says it's irked by Armenia's recognition of ICC. Thank you for joining us. NATO and British officials are warning that Western militaries are running out of ammunition to give to Ukraine. They said this as they urged the bloc's nations to ramp up production to keep Ukraine in the fight against the Russian invaders. In their words, the news of possible ammunition shortfall comes after money to buy weapons for Ukraine was not included in a stopgap spending bill the U.S. Congress passed to the weekend to avoid a federal government shutdown. New uncertainty over the future of U.S. arose on Tuesday when U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who advocated for support of Ukraine, was ousted from his leadership position by Republican colleagues. The developments are troubling news for Ukraine as the war with neighboring Russia is in its 20th month and raises questions over whether Moscow may feel able to outlast Western commitment promises. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke with the leaders of allied countries, the European Union and the NATO military alliance on Tuesday about continuing coordinated support for Ukraine. According to the White House, the call included the leaders of Canada, Germany, Italy, Japan, Poland, Romania, Britain and France, as well as the heads of NATO, the European Commission and the European Council. President Biden convened the call amidst concerns that support for Kiev's war effort against Russia was fading, especially in the United States, where Congress excluded aid to Ukraine from an emergency bill to prevent a partial government shutdown. Attacks on critical. The president reaffirmed the strong commitment of the United States to supporting Ukraine as it defends itself for as long as it takes, uh, as did every other leader on the call. The leaders discussed efforts to continue providing Ukraine with the ammunition and the weapon systems that it needs to defend its territory and to continue strengthening Ukrainian air defenses as they pre prepare for more attacks on critical infrastructure now, certainly, but also certainly in the winter months ahead. Uh, joining President Biden on the call was Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, President von der Leyen of the European Commission, President Michel of the European Council, Chancellor Schultz of Germany, Prime Minister Maloney of Italy, Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, President Duda of Poland, President Ioannis of Romania, and Prime Minister Sunak of the United Kingdom, as well as the Foreign Minister of France, uh, Foreign Minister Colonna. Now, this call, of course, comes on the heels of the continuing resolution passed by Congress over the weekend, a bill that did not include funding to support Ukraine. As President Biden made clear, we cannot under any circumstances allow America's support for Ukraine to be interrupted. Time is not our friend. We have enough funding authorities to meet Ukraine's battlefields, battlefield needs for a bit longer. But we need Congress to act to ensure that there is no disruption in our support. As Ukrainians wage a tough counteroffensive, as their children continue to get ripped from the bosom of their families, and as winter fast approaches, it is imperative that we help them take advantage of every single day. A lapse in support for even a short period of time could make all the difference on the battlefield. Just as critically, such a lapse in support will make Putin believe that he can, out, he can wait us out uh, and that, the, that he can continue the conflict until we and our allies and our partners fold. So the president looks forward to working with Congress to ensure that we make good on our commitment. And he has every expectation that Speaker McCarthy will keep his public commitment to secure the passage of the support needed to help Ukraine at this critical moment. Of course, that statement from John Kirby was made before Kevin McCarthy was removed as Speaker of uh, the House in the United States. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is assuring G7 and NATO leaders that the UK is prepared to support Ukraine with military humanitarian and economic assistance for as long as it takes. 
According to the readout of a call by a Downing Street spokesperson, he outlined the UK's outgoing military, humanitarian and economic assistance to Ukraine and stressed that this support will continue for as long as it takes. Ukraine has seized nearly $5.5 million in assets belonging to the Russian defense company Rosvertal, PJCSC, which includes components for combat helicopters. A Ukrainian anti-corruption court upheld a claim from the Ministry of Justice to transfer the assets of the Russian enterprise to Ukraine, according to the SBU, which added that after the confiscation of the seized product, the SBU will transfer the technological components to the Ukrainian armed forces. Rostovertal PJSC is a Russian helicopter manufacturing company located in the city of Rostov and Don that produces Mi-26 series commercial and military helicopters as well as Mi-35 mm, sorry, 35M and other Night Hunter military models. Its holding company, Russian Helicopters, is part of the Russian conglomerate state corporation, Rostec. The Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky discussed the battlefield situation with commanders in Ukraine's northeast, where he visited troops on one of the hardest fronts of the war with Russia. In his nightly video address, President Zelensky said he'd been near Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, and heard from the commander of Ukraine's ground forces, Alexander Sirsky, on the defense in the area and on offensive action further south near Bakhmut. The president discussed preparation for winter in Kharkiv as Ukraine expects an escalation of Russia's strikes on energy infrastructure. Kharkiv, a major industrial center, has not fallen into Russian hands since the Kremlin invasion in February 2022. Since Kiev began a counteroffensive in the east and south four months ago, Ukrainian troops have made only gradual gains. But Zelensky had rejected foreign criticism that the advance has been marred by poor military strategy. President Zelensky did not give the exact location of his visit, but said it met brigades fighting in the Kopyansk Liman sector in the northeast, where the Ukrainian military says Russian forces have been staging attacks. Meanwhile, as he was visiting the troops, President Zelensky inspected Western supplied heavy military equipment in the country's northeast. Footage released by the Presidential Press Service shows him looking at a Leopard 2 tank and a Swedish-made combat vehicle CV-90 in hideouts in the forest. President Zelensky did not give the exact location of his visit, but said he'd, been, he'd met brigades fighting in the Kopyansk Liman sector in the northeast, where the Ukrainian military says Russian forces have been staging attacks. The Ukrainian military on Tuesday released drone video showing Russian hardware on fire south of Tukmak in the Zaporizhia region. The video was recorded near the settlement of Vitl, 20 kilometers southeast of the Russian-occupied town of Tukmak. Tukmak's capture will be a milestone as Ukrainian troops press southwards towards the Sea of Azov in a military drive that is intended to split Russian forces following Moscow's full-scale invasion in February 2022. Russian air defenses destroyed 31 Ukrainian drones over the border region of Bulgorod, Bryansk, and Kursk overnight. That's according to Russia's defense ministry, which reported the matter in a telegram post saying it had foiled attempted Ukrainian terrorist attacks on Russian territory. The ministry also claimed that a Russian Air Force aircraft prevented a Ukrainian attempt to infiltrate Crimea in a fast military boat and three jet skis, which were heading towards the Cape Tarkankut, the occupied peninsula westernmost point. Now, the Kremlin is complaining that Armenia has acted in an unpartner-like manner towards Russia by subjecting itself to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov told the briefing that Moscow regarded Yerevan as an ally, but had questions as to its current leadership, which will now have to arrest President Putin should he visit Armenia due to an outstanding ICC warrant against him. Russian authorities say they will conduct emergency public warning tests 
at about 7.43 GMT, uh, that's about 10.43 a.m. Moscow time. The tests were to last for one minute at the regional and municipal levels across all Russian regions. According to the emergency ministry, the warning system is designed to timely convey a signal to the population in the event of a threat or emergency of a natural or man-made nature. In recent months, Russia's alarm system has been activated more frequently as Ukraine has launched its counteroffensive against the invasion, mainly with drone attacks. The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs says it has summoned the Moldovan ambassador. The ministry said it had taken reciprocal measures after the expulsion of the head of the Sputnik Moldova news agency from Moldova on September the 13th. The ministry added that the Moldovan ambassador was informed that a number of individuals directly involved in restrictive freedom of speech and rights of Russian journalists in Moldova, as well as inciting anti-Russian sentiments, were banned from entering Russia. They did not name the people who were banned from entering Russia. We now speak with former lecturer on diplomatic and consular relations law, faculty of law, Nasarawa State University, Kefi, Barista Chukwemeka Eze, who speaks to us from our Abuja studios. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning. We must begin in the United States, a key partner for an ally for Ukraine in its prosecution of the war against Russia as it defends itself from the Russian invasion. The ousting of, the, of Kevin McCarthy, the speaker, uh, does it forebode that all is not well on the Western Front? The answer is in the affirmative. All is not well in the Western Front. The internal politics of the United States of America is going to affect the war because the Ukraine Security Initiative uh, Bill that has been on board in Congress since 2014 has not been passed. And uh, bidding, the bidding administration was looking forward to the cooperation of the Kevin McCarthy-led Congress to pass it, or in the short term, include the $6 billion uh, funding of Ukraine in the, in the bill that was just passed, the stopgap bill, to keep the administration running till November 17. It was not included because many members of Congress, especially the GOP members, were opposed to it. And even what uh, Mikati has granted now has led to his ouster. So currently, the pro tempore speaker in the Congress, his business is to ensure that a new speaker is elected. And when a new speaker is elected, I doubt whether the first thing he will do is to begin to think about passing a bill that is pro Ukraine. Recall that the GOP, that's the Republican Party, is in charge of Congress. Uh, and uh, as a result, since Biden is um, of the Democratic Party, uh, and elections, especially as elections draw nearer, the Republicans will want to sound tough. And in sounding tough, their first victim will be the funding of Ukraine the Ukraine war. So basically, all is not well with uh, the Western Front, not just from the United States. You are aware of uh, Poland. Poland is not happy with Ukraine and because Ukraine has took their matter concerning the banning of supply of uh, wheat and other products to the World Trade Organization. You, uh, Poland is not happy that uh, Ukraine did that. Um, besides the other comments from uh, Vladimir, I mean Zelensky, so the, uh, Poland is not happy. Then on the other front is Slovakia. Slovakia has just carried out a parliamentary election, and the leading figure is anti-Ukraine. He's pro-Russia. 
So if you combine what is happening in Slovakia, Poland, and the United States of America, then you will know all is now uh, well with the Western Front. Now, are they also taking support, grassroots, groundswell support for Ukraine in America for granted? Because it appears if you listen to the foreign ministry spokesman of Ukraine yesterday, and some of our analysts as well, they said that this issue with the spending bill uh, is something that happens time and again, and it does not mean that uh, support for Ukraine from America would wane. But this ouster of Kevin McCarthy tells a totally different story, because even though he was in support of, the, uh, of US aid for Ukraine, there were other points in uh, US diplomatic policy, uh, sorry, domestic policy, that were not at par with the promises he made to his Republican fellows when he became speaker. And for that reason, he was ousted, amongst other reasons. Is there a responsibility for the Biden administration and some of the other administrations of the governments that you've just mentioned to carry their people along to make sure that that support that they claim is so huge continues? Uh, you, uh, we, we all know that America is, a, when it comes to politics, is a divided society. And some of them believe that this war is not on their borders. While some of them believe that, it, like Biden and uh, his supporters, that it, that it is of strategic interest to the United States of America. And that is understandable, because if this war is lost, America will lose its influence, and is going to lose it for a very long time to come. More countries will crowd around Russia as a victor. As you know, success has many fathers, and failure is an orphan. Talking about the grand swell of support in America for the Ukraine uh, funding, uh, we should know that this support has to translate to congressional votes. No matter the amount of support, if the Congress fails to its members, they fail to acknowledge this support and transla translate it to votes so that that uh, $6 billion will be approved, then nothing will happen. No amount of street support will change what is on ground. So uh, you recall the last time, I think last December, that Zelensky visited the United States, he addressed a com uh, the combined houses of uh, House of Reps and the Senate. I mean, he had a loud ovation. This current visit in September, it has, it's not so, because the Congress is quite div divided. And as such, uh, what something must give when two elephants fight, it is the grass that will suffer. The fight between the Democrats and the Republicans, there is no way the Ukraine funding will not be a victim. So even if it will be approved, it will be negotiated with the incoming speaker. And nobody knows for now who will be elected. But it depends on the policy and the negotiations in getting a speaker. If the caucus, the Republican, the GOP caucus, uh, call, I mean, ensures that the new speaker makes a commitment not to approve the bill, then that bill will become a casualty. But if uh, they have an open door for the bill to come in, maybe with some conditions, and bidding is ready to abide by those conditions, then the bill will sail through. But definitely not now. Nobody knows when this bill will be passed. And if it's passed so late, the winter is coming, and this will affect the war in Ukraine, because Ukraine is speedily running out of ammunition. It depends on supplies from the U.S. and from several other countries. Yes, Britain, the United Kingdom, has committed itself to continuous funding of Ukraine, but we are aware that their support is not as much as that of the U.S. So if they are going to prop up their support to an extent to fill the vacuum uh, before the bill is passed in the United States of America, that would be good news for Zelensky and the people of Ukraine. But unless that is done, a vacuum will be created, and definitely that will lead to Russia 
having a, an upper hand in this war, and it may bring to the end of the war in favor of Russia. How did you take the Slovakia incidents uh, with the rising to power of the SMRD, SSD party? I think that have said, and they ran on, the, one of the promises they ran on was that they were not going to support Ukraine anymore, militarily speaking. Do you see it as an isolated incident, or do you see other parties in other countries beginning to change their tact? I think uh, what has happened in Slovakia will not be restricted for purpose of analysis to Slovakia. Because uh, let's take Slovakia, for instance. You know, it, it was part of Czechoslovakia before it became an independent country. And mm. Czechoslovakia was, I mean, uh, held by the USSR for many years. There are many elements in that country, not only in that country, in many other countries that have been under USSR influence before the end of USSR in 1991. So they still have parties in those countries supporting them. So the, that of Slovakia is not a, an isolated incident. In the case of Poland, why is the current administration in Poland supporting its farmers who have the opinion that there should be a ban on cheap wheat, soya beans, and other products coming from uh, Ukraine. It is for it not to lose election. If left for it, if not for the complaint of its farmers, uh, Poland would have perhaps allowed uh, the wheat from Ukraine, which is cheaper, and we make the one in Poland more expensive. Uh, so it would have allowed it, but then they are aware there are elements ready to take over. And you are also aware that the current government in Hungary is pro-Russia. It has withheld 500 uh, million um, uh, dollars of uh, uh, Ukraine money, Ukraine aid. So, and it's continuing with the contract for construction of nuclear reactors in Hungary. So it's not an isolated case because many countries, even within Europe, uh, have parties that want to take over from the pro-Ukrainian or pro-West parties currently in government. So this is something that should be watched out and we will continue to look at over the years to come because um, uh, Slovakia is a member of NATO and is acting this way. That means it's ready to defy NATO, it's ready to defy, defy uh, uh, European Union. Uh, let's see how it goes, but it has commitment to abide by the agreements of the European Union and that of NATO. So for it to go solo, perhaps it wants to uh, leave these organizations. But remember, it is still a sovereign country. It may refuse to supply weapons, and it may continue to defy these two institutions, thereby leading to crisis of monumental proportions. Have these developments, Mr. Eze, swung the pendulum towards Russia because of the events that have happened that we just mentioned, you're talking about now, in America and the other areas of the world? And NATO coming up now to say that, look, we need some more ammunition, that there's a danger, that there's a depletion in the supply of weapons for Ukraine. Do you see at uh, this, the, the momentum swinging towards Russia again as this war continues to be protracted? Yes, the momentum is swinging towards Russia. There is a, it will deal a psychological blow on Ukrainian soldiers in the war front. If they discover that weapons will no longer be flowing in, definitely some of them may see it as a lost war. And even some Ukrainians who are not on the front to take it that, oh, this thing is coming to an end. So Ukraine needs all the psychological boost that it can get now. Uh, there are reports that up to 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers have uh, surrendered. Nobody knows how true it is, but 
there are footages to show surrender by Ukraine. No, whether this number is the right number or not, nobody knows. But uh, it may not have uh, been as a direct result of what has happened in these countries. But uh, if Ukraine gets war weary without the right weapons, knowing that the F 16s, F 35s, they are still, the Ukrainian pilots are still in training, and some of them will not be supplied to next year. And winter is here. So if they don't have the right weapons to overcome this winter, definitely that means uh, winter will be their undoing, and uh, they may fall more to Russia. Russia is, has all the weapons to fight a, a protracted war even for the next 10 years. Russia is a superpower. Russia has armed manufacturing companies that are ready to manufacture as much as possible. They have what it takes. They have con some countries supporting them. And uh, so I, I foresee a very terrible situation if the West doesn't get its axe right, right now. Uh, the winter will come in and the Ukraine will be the worst for it. You just showed not long ago the, what's happening in Kharkiv, uh, under serious attack from Russia, Zelensky on a visit to that place. Uh, Ukraine is yet to get uh, new territories and hold on to them because Russia has flattened many of these uh, towns and it will be difficult for Ukrainian soldiers to get land and hold on to it without bombardments from missiles, Russian missiles, without air attacks, without uh, artillery uh, bombardment. So basically, it is a very, very worrisome situation for Ukraine. And you can see uh, they are getting agitated, but the, current, the recent uh, uh, conference of uh, defense companies in Ukraine is uh, somehow giving it boost that uh, these uh, defense companies will come to East Abed. Ukraine's economy also is, is down. To what extent it can get weapons without paying for them? To what extent it has sufficient funds to pay for weapons? Uh, how long it will last for Ukraine to continue with this uh, is something uh, doubtful. But we keep our hands crossed that Russia is having a, a, a better bargain with all these disagreements, with all these happenings in the West. And if you look at their, if you read their telegram posts, you see they are upbeat, believing that not too long from now that Ukraine will kill him. Now, uh, what in your view is an accurate depiction of the current situation of the war between Russia and Ukraine, especially concerning the counteroffensive? For instance, today, uh, the Ukrainian military, and we reported this morning, released a video showing Russian hardware on fire in Tokmak in Zaporizhia region. But just a few days ago, President Vladimir Putin was celebrating the annexation. And no one in Ukraine wants to call it that, of, of Kherson, of uh, Zaporizhia, of the other areas, Donetsk, and saying that they have committed to the fatherland and they are as much Russian as Crimea is. What, in your estimation, is the true picture of the current situation? My estimation of the true picture of the current situation is that Russia is seeing all this as hit and run, because there are no boots on the ground to hold onto those territories that Ukraine bombs. Merely bombing a building, a ship, or some ships, uh, is just to show the world that you are jolting Russia. So Ukraine is unable to take back territories, hold onto them, fight back, overcome defenses, overcome mining of many of these uh, regions. So uh, the Ukraine uh, is trying, but it, it can't go far. The Russia has sufficient personnel ammunition to continue the war. The merely bombing a building in Zaporizhia or in Donetsk, in Luhansk, in uh, Rostov Don, in, and even in, in Moscow, I mean, each time such things happen, Moscow fortifies itself. Moscow uh, has sufficient uh, 
air defenses to overcome these sit and run tactics, and uh, that cannot cause uh, Ukraine to win the war. Uh, assuming the news is that Ukraine in, uh, went into Zaporizhia, took over Zaporizhia, mounted its flag in Zaporizhia, and uh, driven away the Russian soldiers. I think that's the, the news the world will want to hear, that the building caught fire. I mean, war is far beyond that. So any building can catch fire, but they are yet to take territories and hold them. Until that is done, that is when we will take the counteroffensive as being successful. As for now, the speed is that of the snail. They are moving at a snail speed. And when we get, in, get into the winter, if they are unable, as they have been unable in the summer to make uh, mountain successes, I wonder whether in the winter they can make these successes because uh, by the time they hide in trenches to launch attacks, uh, the people can get frozen in these trenches. So definitely they need uh, all the support they can get if they want to survive the winter. But uh, I think they are hopeful that if they could survive the winter last year, that they can survive it today. But the amount of support they were getting last year has to equal the amount of support they get this year. If not, the winter will be terrible for them, uh, and uh, nobody knows uh, whether they will eventually surrender. But uh, the West has a lot to lose if Ukraine surrenders in the war, and that's why the European Union has committed itself to support Ukraine as long as it goes. But you, 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 uh, oratory, this matter is beyond oratory. So it's beyond verbal commitments, oral promises, they have to turn into something that can be seen on the ground. And when they have that, if they have the supply the F-16s, F-35s, and other like uh, ATACMS from the United States that is being rumored that they will supply to Ukraine, if all these things are on the ground, I think Ukraine will be able to survive this winter. But unless that happens, then no, nothing stopping Russia. Even the intermittent attacks on buildings, uh, uh, showcasing the videos, I mean, uh, uh, war is far beyond that. It takes but much more to hold ground. Finally, have you noticed that no one is talking about peace talks anymore? A very worrying development has happened concerning the building of classrooms for Ukrainian children as this war continues, not worrying because they're building the classrooms, but because they have to do that so that these children can get an education. So the psychological impact of the war, the ecological impact of the war, the social impact of the war, not the talk of the humanitarian impact of the war, continues to fester and grow and spread. And children are the worst for it. The underprivileged are the worst for it. Uh, special needs and physically challenged are the worst for it. What about those in Ukraine and Russia who have intermarried and they're on different sides of, 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 the, of, the, of the conflict and, and they're they are part Russian, part uh, Ukrainian and they are in the same family but on different sides of the war. What is finally your... Um, what, 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 do you, what do you think? That no one at this point... Has everyone thrown in the towel for peace? No, I think uh, peace, peace suggests, I have said it on this program in the past, that those peace uh, moves, though necessary, but they, they, they may not have the desired effect because Russia is a superpower and it wants peace terms to be on its, peace terms to be as it wants it. Russia, I have said in the past, will not accept peace terms that will return Donetsk, Luhansk, Kapur uh, Zaporizhia, and maybe part of Kherson, the ones they have not surrendered, I mean, given to Ukraine, and many other parts of uh, Ukraine. They were not, uh, including Crimea, which they took in 2014, and you know their Black Sea Fleet, the fifth uh, fleet 
of Russia naval fleet is, is uh, positioned in Crimea. There is no way Russia will hand over Crimea. You recall in, the, in history, Russia has fought wars concerning Crimea. Russia fought Turkey, current Turkey concerning Crimea in the past. So Russia regards Crimea as part of Russia. So Russia will not submit. So this is why uh, the peace moves, you, you are not seeing it, because they have two irreconcilable positions. Uh, Ukraine wants this parts of its country return to it, and Russia says, no, we have amended our constitution. These parts are no longer part of Ukraine. Russia will not listen to any peace move that will make those parts return to it. And the war, like you say, children are suffering. Recall that Maria Belova, the Minister of uh, Humanitarian Affairs in Russia, and Vladimir Putin have been, I mean, they are before the ICC. They've been indicted for crimes against humanity, uh, uh, which is uh, pursuant to codified in Article 7 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court of 1998 and uh, uh, war crimes codified in Article 8 also of the same statute. Not, uh, not only that, you are aware that the G Geneva Conventions of 1949 and its additional protocols 1 and 2 of 1977 uh, allegedly violated and these two individuals have been indicted. So if there is no victory for Russia, it means Putin can be arrested and he will be a personal non grata in many countries. Uh, Russia is already complaining that Armenia has acceded to the Rome Statute. And by the provision, relevant provision of the Rome Statute, once you accede or ratify or become a, a member state, definitely you are bound to arrest Putin, having been indicted. So uh, Russia will do everything to win this war because losing the war will mean uh, Putin being arrested. And Indeed. Putin is a symbol of Russian nation nationalism. They will never, Russia will never allow the symbol of their national uh, nationalism to be arrested. So Indeed. that's why they will do everything to win this war. And no statute of limitations on, on war crimes, obviously. So even if the war ends tomorrow, uh, President Putin is still fair game for the ICC. But we thank you, uh, Vice Chukwemeka Eze, for being with us and sharing with us all your thoughts and views and insights on the matter. Mr. Chukwemeka Eze is a former lecturer on diplomatic and consular relations law, faculty of law, Nasara State University, Kafi, who joined us from Abuja. Many thanks. Thank you very much. After the break, Slovakia's foreign minister says Ukraine must win the war before joining the EU or NATO. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the So For More stretch of today's coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. We could quickly pick up where the Russian energy giant Gazprom has put out information that Europe, which used to be its main source of revenue, is short of natural gas and may face challenges. This comes more than a year after mysterious blasts damaged the Nord Stream pipelines. Gazprom's gas exports almost halved last year to 100.9 billion cubic meters due to political fallout with Europe over Ukraine and after the undersea Nord Stream pipelines, the largest gas exporting route for Russia to European markets was blown up in September 2022. Russian prosecutors are demanding a nine and a half year jail sentence for fugitive former state TV journalist Marina Osyenikova 
famous for bursting into a news broadcast with a placard that read, Stop the war, and they're lying to you. The foreign-based independent news site MediaZone said the prosecution had made the demand at her trial in absentia for distributing fake news, a term that includes any information about Russia's war in Ukraine that is at odds with the official narrative. Uh, the individual fled Russia with her daughter for an unspecified European country a year ago after escaping from house arrest, according to her lawyer, saying she had no case to answer. Slovakia's foreign minister, Miroslav Wachowski, is insisting that Ukraine must win its war against Russia before joining NATO and the European Union. Speaking at the Warsaw Security Forum, Wachowski called it a necessary precondition for the country to regain its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Noting he just returned from Kiev on Tuesday morning, Wachowski says Ukrainians are doing their best and must be helped. Now, Ukraine's exchange rate is more flexible, and to give us more information on that, another news concerning the war in Ukraine and how it affects the world of business is Channel Television's business correspondent, Ini John Mekwa. Ini, good morning. Good morning. So, it is more flexible. Yeah. Why? Um, so, um, bef when the war started, um, they had to really manage it, so they fixed it as uh, exchanging uh, the, the revenue to the dollar was fixed, okay. you know, but uh, with time, I guess, I mean, you just, talk, just talked about how uh, countries, I think the U.S., uh, U.K.'s uh, uh, secretary was there last week, you know, still giving aid to um, Ukraine. Uh, we see them at least getting to a stable, maybe a stable war economy is what we can call it. And, you know, the other time we also talked about how the war uh, economy is also booming. So the war um, ministry, the war factories, they are like the only ones employing people now. And uh, they seem to be waking up and catching up with the need of weapons and, and all of that ammunition. So we see that that factory or that industry is waking up and contributing, you know, to the uh, national income. So with all of this, it seems like the economy is trying to stabilize. So now we see that uh, they can allow the forces of demand and supply to determine the exchange rate. However, you know, I don't think any country really allows it to go like that. So they are still, it's a managed, flexible or managed floating policy that they're doing. I think they place it about 29 uh, Rivnia for a dollar at this time. So uh, it's not as tight as it used to be because, of course, that one was more like artificial. So this should reflect the state of the economy. Uh, more at this time, and they have the confidence that uh, they're waking up. Uh, they they found some alternative routes, you know, for their grain, even though they're still, you know, having issues with their neighboring countries. But I mean, uh, they seem to have stabilized a bit, and so that's why they decided to allow the currency, the exchange rate, to reflect their reality to an extent. You know, banking is naturally a conservative profession. Yes, it is. And uh, but now with what's happening in Russia, the banking system there, they have so many challenges, yeah. not envious of them at all. Mm -hmm. Now, as of October the 1st, 2023, uh, day before yesterday, you, you, you mentioned that they are no longer able to share information on the yeah, SWIFT. Swift. That's thing. Russia. Yeah, no, this Russia. was Ukraine, this is Russia, yeah. Okay, yeah, Russia, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, I mean, when I first saw the story, I tell you, the first thing that came to my mind was when the war started, one of the first major sanctions was that Russia would not have access to SWIFT. So uh, Russians uh, would not be able to use SWIFT. And uh, if you wanted to send money to Russia, you wouldn't be able to use SWIFT, which is a global, you know. And we know that Russia, uh, along with the BRICS, some of those BRICS countries, are talking about having an alternative to SWIFT. So you, you can do international transactions, banking transactions, using that platform. They've, you know, they've so been taking up that platform. Before, yeah, man, that, I thought, I thought yes. so too, but, but we, we've had several discussions here, yeah. uh, Ulumide, mm. and we have seen how, for instance, you would not think that um, <laughs> the pipeline coming from Russia and taking gas 
to Europe passes through Ukraine, mm. and yet Ukraine and Russia are at war. Remember mm. how we talked about how sometimes African countries do not really know the details of some of these mm. things, and so we say, oh, we have a problem with our neighboring country, and so we're cutting off out of them. It seems these countries never really totally cut off their relations, especially when it has to do with needs. I mean, mm. we've talked about how the West is sanctioning Russia and everything, but the sanctions exclude food because it's a necessity. Yeah. And to a large extent, you still have gas, you know, going through to these countries. You know, so this was also, I thought that SWIFT was already totally cut off from Russia, but we're not discovered that Russia was still using SWIFT for um, transaction information. So now what they say they will do is to stop Russians from using SWIFT to um, transmit transaction information in and within Russia, but they can mm. still use it outside Russia in inter-border uh, uh, transactions. They can still use SWIFT uh, to share information and all of that. I mean, we've also talked about how uh, there's the attempt to cut crypto or stop Russians from using crypto for their payments and all of that. But when you look closer, you still find that there's still some uh, light transactions going on. So, I mean, I think there are so many lessons for um, African countries, especially because sometimes we just get um, a story uh, from the West and we just take it hook, line and sinker. But if you look closer, you will see that those countries always look out for themselves. I mean, if we're so angry with Russia and we have put them on sanction, but we have not sanctioned the necessities. Do you mm -mm. understand? Those so things... it's food for thought. That translates obviously to a worsening situation for the SWIFT payment system. It's one of the reasons why uh, the Black Sea Grain deal expired and yeah. Russia had issues. Yeah. They wanted part of that yeah. to be resolved yeah, they want, as well. Yeah, they want their banking, especially their big banks that deal with uh, international transactions to be accepted back into it and, and yeah. all of that. Mm. Russia is also lifting bans on diesel export. Yeah, remember we talked about how they put that ban uh, because there were domestic demands that couldn't be met. And so they put that, they called the temporary ban, so it seems they want to lift it uh, for exports of diesel, but gasoline is still on the ban. Okay. And they say because domestically they are now being saturated of diesel, so that's why mm. they um, want to lift that ban and see how it goes and see if, if it can still, but I guess with gasoline, there's still a whole not because a whole need for it because that's what they use mostly for agricultural uh, transactions, for agricultural equipment, uh, agricultural transportation, and all of that. So it's it's, it's a ban they say they want to leave even if it's temporal. Uh, they also need the revenue too coming from outside Russia, but of course they have to feed their people and ensure that um, in-house they are satisfied first Obviously, before they can to make uh, sure that these streams of revenue continue to yeah. get into the country. Finally, the cost of war on the Russian economy is, yeah. is dire, it I'm is. sure, but they are very resilient. Yeah, they, and they are. seem to be in it for the long haul. Well, it seems they are planning for the long haul because we see proposal for the 2024 budget, a 2025 budget, right. and of course uh, we see more spending allocated for military. For instance, for 2024. Uh, They've gone to about $111 billion. That's uh, how many trillion? That's 11 trillion rubles for 2024. That's mm. about three and a half times their budget at, uh, for pre-war period. Uh, That's but a lot of money. It's a, it's a <laughs> lot of money. I mean, $111 billion. So how are they going to fund it is also another thing because, you know, their revenue is dwindling. Their major customers, especially for gas and oil, is yeah. Europe. Even yeah. though I heard, I heard you read that uh, uh, Russia is saying that they know that Europe will come back to them because they are short on gas. But mm. I mean, Europe has also reached out to other countries, you understand, that could give them uh, a country, I think there was a, a country in Africa that also supplies gas to Europe, to Europe you know, uh, since the beginning of the war. So their revenue is dwindling, but their expenditure is going up. We'll see how, maybe their ingenuity will come back again, and we'll see how they will handle uh, uh, budgets for 2024. Indeed, which is a lot, a lot to remains to be seen. A whole lot. Thanks, Ini. Ini <laughs> Thank John Mecca, Channel Salvation business correspondent. And just before we go, the United States military is reportedly getting ready to send tactical ballistic missiles armed with cluster munition to Ukraine once President Joe Biden approves the move. 
In an interview, the Army Assistant Secretary for Acquisition, Doug Bush, says the U.S. has been postured for the eventuality for a while, adding that it's ready to go fast. The Army Tactical Missile System is a long-range guided missile that gives operational commanders the immediate firepower to win the deep battle, according to its manufacturer, Lockheed Martin. ATACMS missiles were first deployed in the U.S. military operation against Iraq in 1991. And finally, guess why? Swedish Foreign Minister Tobias Bilstrom was absent from the historic meeting of the European Union foreign ministers in Kiev on Monday. Apparently, he forged his, rather, he forgot his passport. The Vienna-based newspaper said that the, quoting the, the diplomatic sources, as saying that Bilstrom was denied entry at the Polish-Ukrainian border after failing to produce his travel document. Foreign ministers of Hungary, Latvia, and Poland also missed the meeting. Obviously not because they forgot their passports, must have had a lot on his mind. And that's where we leave it on today's coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide Macaulay. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.